Welcome, everybody. We're very excited to welcome uh, Dr. Thomas Lovejoy here. Um, Tom has been involved with the Society for Conservation Biology, I won't say for how many years, uh, but is one of our founders. And we're very excited to have you joining us as our inaugural webinar Wednesday speaker. So, Honor. yay. So just a little bit of background uh, about Tom. Um, he coined the term biological diversity, which is something I think you're very proud mm -hmm. of. And Somebody had to. <laughs> and in 2010, you were elected president, pre professor, sorry, in the Department of Environmental Science at George Mason University. Um, he's a senior fellow at the United Nations Foundation in Washington, D.C., and serves as president of the Heinz Center from 2002 to 2008. Uh, and there, I think you were also the biodiversity chair in that position. Mm -hmm. um, spanning the political spectrum, you've served on the Science Environmental Councils under Reagan, Bush, and Clinton. Um, and, you know, you've really done so much to build this whole field. Uh, so, again, with SCB helping to found the society, but also you started the series Nature on public broadcasting service. And so well, just so things. many things yeah. that you've done as an influence into this field. So we are yes. very honored to have you here. And we thank you for joining us. And I think our audience will just love to hear what you have to say today. So it, it's fun to be here and, and to do this inaugural uh, webinar. Uh, so I've, I've chosen a, a talk that uh, I like to give, which I call a wild solution for climate change. There will be elements in it uh, which will be totally obvious to this audience, um, but maybe some of the ways I sort of present it uh, might be interesting. Um, and, and then it ends up with a very positive note in terms of, of what ecosystem restoration could do to get us uh, a much better outcome to this really uh, scary challenge. Great, so I like to call it a wild solution for climate change. Uh, and it basically comes out of 30 years of working on the topic of biodiversity and, uh, and climate change. And I like to start with this slide of a peregrine falcon looking down from Central Park West on the climate change march before the General Assembly mm -hmm. uh, in about two or three years ago. Uh, and this is the latest of the three books uh, I have produced while following this topic over time. Uh, this is the second one I did with Lee Hanna. And you might ask, why are there musk oxen chosen for the cover? And there are two answers to that. One is musk oxen have been selected over time to capture attention. So if this book is sitting on a table with 20 others, it will stand out. Uh, but sort of more relevant, uh, musk oxen, reindeer, and caribou are all suffering from climate change because when they go to forage in winter, instead of having snow to brush aside as they look for the vegetation, uh, they often encounter frozen rain. And as a consequence, they're raising uh, underweight calves. And that's precisely the way climate change uh, and biodiversity interact in very precise ways, which are essentially specific to the particular features of the particular species. I like to start talking about this topic by focusing on uh, the Swedish scientist Arrhenius, who in 1896 asked a really important question, which is why, why is the planet a habitable temperature for humans and other forms of life? Why isn't it too cold? And the answer, of course, was the the natural levels of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere trapping radiant heat, uh, namely the greenhouse effect. So climate change scientist science is actually pretty simple and it's really old. Uh, but what Arrhenius would not have been aware of was much about the detailed history of the temperature of the planet in the preceding 100,000 years or so. And in particular, 
the last 10,000 years in the upper right in this graph, uh, a period of unusual stability in the planet's climate. And that includes all human history, recorded human history, some unrecorded human history, the origins of agriculture, uh, the origin of human settlements. Basically, it makes the point that the entire human enterprise is based on the assumption of a stable climate. And of course, that is now changing. And ecosystems have been adapting to a stable climate for 10,000 years. So there are various signals in nature of response to climate change. Some of them are physical changes. So lakes are, are uh, freezing later in the autumn and the ice is breaking up uh, earlier in the spring in the Northern hemisphere. The Arctic Ocean uh, has, has ice on it, uh, floating on it, which advances and retreats. It's getting thinner. Uh, it is retreating more uh, every summer. Here you can see the advance and retreat uh, annually. This only goes to about 2007. It's obviously gone much beyond that. That It's not that far off in the future that there'll be a lot of easy sea transport across the Arctic Ocean. Uh, around the planet where there are glaciers, most of them are in retreat. Here we're looking at Glacier National Park, 1938 on the left, uh, and 1981 on the right. <clears throat> and Glacier National Park is clearly headed to a point where it will be that only in name. Uh, in the tropics where there are glaciers on top of high mountains like Kinabalu or Kilimanjaro, all tropical glaciers are retreating at a rate that they will be gone within 15 years. Uh, and another physical manifestation is sea level rise. Uh, it has gone beyond what is shown in this particular image. Uh, it's on the average about eight inches of sea level rise around the world. Uh, and it has gone beyond just the thermal expansion, the melt from ice on the land. Uh, ice that's floating on the ocean, like in the Arctic, uh, actually is just like an ice, cl ice cube in a glass of water. It doesn't affect sea level rise. Uh, and on the eastern shore of Maryland, where there is natural subsidence uh, from uh, recovery from the glacial period, uh, that together with sea level rise is affecting the Blackwater National Wildlife Refuge to the point that it it is clearly headed to be a marine refuge. Uh, very little ongoing debate anymore about the increased frequency of more intense tropical cyclones. Uh, we've had some serious ones hit the United States, uh, New York, uh, Texas, et cetera, New Orleans. Uh, and there's absolutely no question about the increase of wildfire in the Western US. Uh, mostly originally caused by warmer summers, earlier snow melts, less snowpack on average, uh, but now with a contributing factor of dead trees, which I will touch on later. But the rest of what I want to talk about is the biological response to climate change. So in many parts of the world, uh, you have data such as we're looking at here for a bunch of flower species uh, in at the Royal Botanic Garden at Kew, uh, all blooming earlier than previously. And it's not just trees and plants which are changing their phenology, uh, so are animal species. So in this particular example, tree swallows are migrating earlier arriving earlier, nesting earlier, laying eggs earlier. Uh, and that's happening with a lot of a lot of bird species and at least two have ceased to migrate. So things are changing not just on the land, they're also changing in the oceans, if anything, more rapidly uh, because so many ocean species are not rooted to a substrate. Um, so plankton, fish, the lobster fisheries moving on the East Coast, uh, et cetera. 
And um, here in the Chesapeake Bay, the great estuary on the East Coast, the eelgrass communities turn out to be very temperature sensitive. <clears throat> so they are literally moving northward almost year by year. And it's not just in boreal regions or temperate regions that we're finding change. We're also seeing changes in the tropics. They're less about temperature, uh, but we're looking at the Monteverde cloud forest and the issue for Monteverde is the clouds are now forming with greater fe frequency at higher altitude. Uh, so less moisture is getting to the cloud forest in condensation, which is pretty serious since 98% of the moisture of a cloud forest comes from condensation. Uh, and we're, we're seeing in many instances of what are called decoupling events when two features in nature are closely timed together, but one uses uh, basically a clock and the other uses temperature as the cue. And so in this particular example, snowshoe hares are very much tied in their change from their winter to their summer pelage uh, in terms of day length. Uh, but actually the habitat in which they occur is very uh, tuned in to temperature change. So uh, there are lots of examples of bright, bright white snowshoe hares in winter form uh, standing out against snowless backgrounds and being wonderful uh, opportunities for predators. Uh, so this, this slide, which I like to say I would penalize any student if they did it because it's not readable, is to make the point that what I've just been talking about is, is no longer just the occasional anecdote. Uh, it's statistically robust that you can see the fingerprints of climate change all over the world. Uh, the more in question, more important question is what does it look like going ahead? Because what I've just been talking about essentially are minor ripples in the fabric of life. Um, and there are things you can do to, to sort of get a projection. And one is to look at the climatic envelope in which a particular feature occurs, uh, like sugar maple, and then look where that climatic envelope will be in the big computer models, uh, for example, with double levels of carbon dioxide. <clears throat> so the image on the screen shows where sugar maple and all the good things it does in terms of foliage, maple syrup, and maple sugar occur today in the Northeast United States uh, with double CO2 levels. And I guess something didn't click right, but you'll have to go to Canada for it. Mm -hmm. um, and this is to make a pretty simple minded point, but it's a really important one that the two most important physical parameters for organisms on land are temperature and moisture. And in aquatic environments, their temperature and pH. And all of that is changing. Is that an issue? No, I guess it isn't. Um, so some species will be pretty much locked into geographic features uh, like trout and cold water streams. Uh, so that's clearly going to be an issue going forward. A lot of organisms that live in high places will be moving upward in altitude, tracking their climatic conditions, uh, like the American pika, which is in isolated colonies in the Rocky Mountains. Uh, and the problem is, is that at a certain point, there's no further up where they can go. So we've already lost one of the, the colonies of the American pika. Uh, this is from the Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology. They call it the escalator to extinction. It's about this moving up slope. And we're looking at 1985 on the left with three vegetation types. Uh, I think this is in Colombia. Uh, and on the right is, is what it looks like in 2017. And you can see that the uppermost vegetation type and the bird species, which was characteristic of it, the variable ant shrike, uh, are no longer there. Happily, they occur elsewhere. Uh, but this is 
good example of what it's like uh, as species are trying to adapt to climate change on a slope. And basically they all start moving uh, and they don't all move at the same rate. Uh, so it puts a lot of ripples through the ecological communities. Uh, species on coasts obviously are going to be playing with uh, sea level rise and will do better than others. Uh, the salt marsh, marsh sparrow uh, is one that is particularly under pressure because it, it basically has a reproductive cycle which it has to pull off between basically two really high tides a month apart. Uh, sea level rise will affect the Everglades uh, and more than anything it will be you know sea level intrusion uh, saltwater intrusion uh, and among other things it's likely to favor the American crocodile over the American alligator because the crocodile is able to excrete salt and the alligator cannot. Uh, species on islands like the key deer are going to be very vulnerable, especially low-lying islands. So there will be no key deer unless they are transplanted somewhere. And even on islands which are not low-lying, there will be a lot of change and an in inability for species to actually uh, travel in the direction that the change would would be like were they uh, on a mainland. And the third category of species uh, in the early most sensitive groups are all those whose natural history uh, is keyed to <clears throat> ice. Of course, the polar bear being the poster child. So the more important question is, what does it look like going ahead and what are some of the complications? And what I'm trying to do here is build an argument uh, that we are working up to serious changes in the biology of the planet that make no sense whatsoever. Uh, and to build a compelling case for stopping at one and a half degrees and then finding a way to actually pull that off. So the first of the complications uh, we all know from island biogeography, uh, that fragmentation of habitats is the universal pattern of human occupation almost anywhere in the world. Um, and basically what that does is it creates an obstacle course for species trying to attract their required conditions. Uh, but it has a solution, which is putting natural connections back into the environment. Uh, so at least this complication, there are things we can, can do to essentially uh, ameliorate the impact. Second complication, which we know from studying past climate change, uh, is that species don't move together. It's the individual species that move, not the ecosystem. Um, and so here we're looking at what happened after the last glacier retreated in Europe. Uh, three mammal species, two tree species, one insect species, and you can see there's no common pattern. So basically what happens at a certain point as species are moving is ecosystems essentially disassemble and the surviving species uh, end up reassembling into ecosystems and assemblages, which is very hard uh, to uh, imagine in advance. So it becomes a really serious management challenge. Um, our computer models are linear and gradual. We know that actually the, the climate does not work that way, that there are abrupt changes in the climate system. One future one could be around what happens to the Atlantic co co conveyor belt, which brings warm water from the Pacific and the Indian Ocean up through the Atlantic uh, to between Greenland and Europe, where it sinks uh, and cools and doubles back under itself. 
And it's a major way in which energy is transported uh, around the planet. And it has been known to shut down in geologic time. But whether that's imminent or not, we are already seeing abrupt changes in ecosystems. And right here in North America, the prominent one is what's happening to the coniferous forests of Western North America, uh, where basically the balance has been tipped in favor of the native bark beetles. And this is not functioning either. I don't know why, but anyway, uh, it's, it's essentially a 23 year, it's a really cool slide, but uh, basically what happens is the summers get longer, beetles get another generation, uh, more survive the winter, and suddenly there are vast areas of Western North America with coniferous trees with significant fractions of them, up to 70% in some cases, uh, dead from the bark beetles. And of course that then feeds into the fire cycle, uh, which is being caused by physical change. Um, probably the most notable uh, ecosystem abrupt change that we're aware of is, is the one happening with tropical coral reefs, which all look like this when I was a graduate student. Uh, wonderful technicolor, highly diverse, highly productive uh, ecosystem that supported the 5% of humanity that live within 100 meters of tropical coral reefs. And they're extremely sensitive to increases in temperature. And that causes the coral animal to eject the alga, the fundamental partnership on which the whole ecosystem is built, and you get what are called bleaching events, and the whole system crashes, uh, the diversity, the productivity, the benefit. Um, and yes, reefs can require recover from a bleaching event, but not when it gets chronic. So it's a really serious problem, so I think it was 60% of the Great Barrier Reef bleached last year. Um, and then we're seeing changes at an even greater scale. Uh, so everybody knows I love the Amazon. Uh, so what we're looking at here is how moisture is generated around the planet uh, day by day uh, throughout the year. And it's mostly over the oceans and over the equator, with the big exception being on the right hand of this slide where you can see that the Amazon is actually generating moisture, not just having it fall, it's generating and it makes half of its own rainfall. Um, and that is now being undercut by deforestation, use of fire and climate change. And we're now seeing historically unprecedented droughts, 2005, 2010, 2016, uh, probably the first flickers of a tipping point that could lead to dieback in the southern and eastern Amazon. So that would be a huge hit, obviously, for biodiversity, really terrible for the people who depend on those forests, uh, and a huge carbon to the atmosphere. Uh, the biggest of these system changes we're seeing involves acidification of the oceans, something that we overlooked, uh, dramatically overlooked until 2005, even though it's simple high school chemistry, that some of the CO2 absorbed by the oceans is turning into carbonic acid. So the oceans are now a tenth of a pH unit more acid than in pre-industrial times. It's actually a serious number because of the scale. That's sort of like 30% more acid. And it's really important for all the organisms that depend on the carbonate equilibrium uh, to build their shells and skeletons. Uh, many of them are familiar. Others are less familiar, uh, including this little sea butterfly. And let's see if we can get it to actually move, do you think? Mm -hmm. 
There we go. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's a tiny little snail. Its its foot has been modified to actually flap like wings and maintain it in the water column. They're, they exist in untold numbers at the base of food chains in the North Atlantic and off of Alaska. And they're already showing the effects of ocean acidification on their shells. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. So what I've been trying to do is build up to this point of, of acknowledging that we're, we are close to, to playing with critical thresholds in the Earth system. Makes no sense at all to be doing that. Uh, so the issue then becomes, what can we do about all of that? And the first thing is uh, we need to, to continue to question the two degree target uh, because it's too high. It's too high from the point of ice systems. It's too high from the point of uh, ecological systems because the planet just becomes very hard to manage biologically beyond one and a half degrees. Uh, and if you want one little factoid to help you think about the two degree target being inappropriate, it's that the last time the earth was two degrees warmer, sea level was four to six meters higher. You know, I mean, you don't need to actually know anymore, right? Uh, so the question is, uh, what could be quote unquote a safe level? Uh, Jim Hansen has been talking about 350 parts per million for a long time. Uh, that's essentially the one and a half degrees, uh, which the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change actually came out in favor of uh, some months ago. Uh, so how do we deal with all of that? Uh, so this is Dr. Planet, made the diagnosis. What is he prescribing? Uh, Revise conservation strategies, some way to eliminate emissions, uh, and obviously it's no longer a matter of a choice. We have to be both reducing greenhouse gas production and finding out ways to adapt to the climate change that's already taking place. There are a whole bunch of things to do to improve conservation strategies, connectivity. We've mentioned but reducing other stresses is really important. Uh, and we can look at particular places like South Florida, where restoring the sheet flow of water, at least to some degree, would build back uh, the wetlands at the end of the peninsula and protect it against some storm surge. Obviously a huge energy agenda, uh, which I'm not expert in and not going to go into uh, but then there's all the CO2 that goes into the atmosphere every year from changes to biological systems. Uh, so the numbers you get for forests depend whether you're looking at the net or the gross. Uh, the gross can actually be up to 30% of annual emissions. It's a big number. Uh, so this is sort of the annual equation, uh, essentially, the carbon from deforestation, maybe five times as much from burning old tropical ecosystems, which is what fossil fuels are, half going into the atmosphere and the other half sort of divided between land and oceans. How can we play with that equation? Maybe even change the direction of one of those arrows. Um, and we need to do it with great urgency because once greenhouse gases are in the atmosphere, they stay there a long time unless we bring it back into biological systems. Um, so one of the really interesting things here is what the biological systems of the planet can do for us. Um, and it won't be enough uh, we'll need to figure out other ways to remove CO2 from the atmosphere, but we know a lot more about it than we did a year and a half ago, and it's very promising. So we know that twice in the history of life on Earth, uh, 
There were screamingly high levels of CO2 brought down by natural processes. Uh, the first when land plants uh, appeared and the second when modern flowering plants appeared, doing it all more efficiency, efficiently. The planet actually fixed those levels and brought them down to pre-industrial levels. Uh, but we don't have tens of millions of years uh, to wait for that to happen. Uh, so in January of 2018, a new estimate was put out of the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere from destroyed and degraded ecosystems, a much bigger number than had been thought before, literally twice as much, 400 to 500 billion tons of carbon. And to translate that into a part per million, just divide by 7.7. .7. So right here now, you can compute in your head uh, how you could pull 30 parts per million out of the atmosphere and still have some more potential to do, do that kind of activity. So suddenly it turns out, you know, that the CO2 from destroyed and degraded ecosystems uh, the carbon uh, that's in that uh, uh, atmospheric state is actually equal to what remains in living ecosystems. So it's a really big number, and it's also a really big opportunity. Uh, so, and, you know, it goes to how we manage our forests. Uh, it goes to how we manage uh, grasslands and grazing land. Uh, and what do you get if you improve grasslands and grazing land and you want to use them for grazing? You get better grazing, right? Uh, so all of these are things that are sensible to do anyway. Uh, it's modifying agricultural systems so they don't leak carbon, but instead accumulate carbon and the soil gets more fertile. Uh, more recently, there's been uh, a lot of attention on what's called blue carbon, uh, what you can actually uh, accomplish by restoring coastal wetlands. And of course, mangroves are big in all of that. And that's the distribution of mangroves in the world, but it actually adds up to a lot of carbon. And if you, I don't have time to go into this one, but if you actually do the proper calculation of the benefits uh, from mangroves uh, and remove the subsidies that are often engaged in cutting them down and creating shrimp farms, you would never do that. So basically every shrimp farm that's in a mangrove area should be moved somewhere else and mangroves should be restored. Uh, so the last slides here are, are all about the carbon debt, the carbon potential. Uh, these have not been published yet. Uh, they're Woods Hole Research Center property, um, but it really gives you a sense of the potential here. So that's just carbon debt in the soil mm. in most of the major agricultural areas of the world. We've been mining the carbon. Right? Um, this is the estimate of current uh, above ground carbon storage and of course tropical forests stand out uh, as being very carbon dense uh, and this is what you could get with restoration right? mm -hmm. the storage that has it's basically been foregone uh, but could be used uh, and so that's the amount if you restored it all, what it would look like. Uh, and this gives those images uh, side by side so you can compare them. Uh, paper will be published pretty soon. Um, so keep an eye out for it from Woods Hole Research Center. Uh, but anyway, the interesting thing about all of this is we're doing it at the time that we're adding a couple billion people to the world. Uh, so what does that do to all of it? Well, David Tillman has actually figured out you can feed all those coming billions uh, without destroying another square inch of nature. 
uh, through a combination of Im improvements in productivity, uh, really tackling food waste. Forty percent of the food in this country is wasted. Uh, in other places, it's wasted because it doesn't get to market. Uh, and through adjustments in diet, which our doctors have been telling us to do anyway. Uh, so that's that's the one solution for climate change. It's it's basically engaging in ecosystem restoration at a planetary scale, recognizing that the planet works not just as a physical system, but as a linked biological and physical system. Uh, it's something that the individual can contribute to because anybody can plant a tree or help restore a wetland. So it's no longer, this problem is too big, I couldn't possibly do anything about it. Mm. Uh, and so that is the wild solution. That's the real hope that people will recognize that it's a living planet and we will re-green the emerald planet and make it habitable for humans and other forms of life. Excellent. Thank you. Where we'd like to move to now is question and answers. Um, this is your opportunity to ask questions of Dr. Lovejoy. And so please post them now in the chat box and we will be moderating that and asking you questions. We'd love to hear from you um, specific to uh, this talk or other questions you may have for Dr. Lovejoy. Yeah, so one question. One question we had was about, um, you know, a lot of a lot of talk. People talk about doom and gloom. You know, what what's an optimistic message that you could give people that ask about climate change? Well, the the optimistic message is, you know, by recognizing that it's actually a living planet, uh, and that we can restore a lot of its capacity. Uh, we have a major solution that's a win win. Not the only solution, but a major solution. And my, my sense is, is that if that really catches fire, it's going to actually change how people think about the natural world. I mean, not everybody, but enough that it could really be a sea change. Um, and we have a specific question about um, climate change and its effect on pollinators. How, how is that being addressed? Is it being addressed enough? Uh, so I, I, I think it's actually not a very clear subject at the moment. Uh, and I think a bunch of things are happening to pollinators all at the same time, but climate will be part of them. And I think we need a, a, a crash research and conservation program for pollinators mm -hmm. without any question. At George uh, Mason, perhaps, with Dr. Lovejoy teaching it? Well, I don't know. We can see. I mean, we, we have a new Institute for Sustainable Earth at George Mason, and maybe that can be one of the topics. It's a, it's a big issue. Yeah. Um, and how about, uh, we have we have some fans from the Cloud Bridge Nature Reserve in Costa Rica um, that have been working on a reforestation project um, to bridge corridors between wildlife. And um, they are wondering, you know, where do we go from here in their context, in a reforestation context on climate change? Is there anything that they can do to ramp up? Well, you know, I mean, Costa Rica has this really extraordinary history uh, as the Green Republic, but that doesn't mean it's a perfect, you know, situation. And uh, so there is there's there are important opportunities in Costa Rica for further uh, ecosystem restoration, uh, and I know there's been a fair amount of forest recovery in recent years. I actually have a graduate student who's studying that for his PhD, uh, and you have a president in Costa Rica who's you know set a target for the elimination of of greenhouse gas production. Um, so as I like to say, keep an eye on Costa Rica because they're usually gonna light the way. Mm -hmm. um, and what about, what about in a country like Brazil where reforestation efforts are happening but there might be a political issue more arising than in Costa Rica? What do you see for Brazil's future? 
Well, you know, right at the moment there there are uh, uh, upsetting headlines from time to time from the new Brazilian government about how they're viewing all of this. Uh, but I had I was had the the honor of being at a lunch for the vice president of Brazil on Monday, uh, and he completely acknowledges climate change is real. Uh, he knows they have some obligations under the Paris Agreement to to do some reforestation. Uh, and if you add that together with uh, the awareness about the Amazon in Brazil and its importance, it's, it's a really high percentage. And Brazil has the highest percentage recognition of the word biodiversity of any country in the world. And why is that, you might ask? And I think it's because the Earth Summit was in Brazil. And for weeks and weeks and months before and after, that was what dominated the headlines. Uh, and public opinion in Brazil is, is very much in favor of protecting the Amazon. Uh, so even though there may be some uh, straying from that at the moment, uh, I think the potential for a great outcome is there. And what probably 98% of the people listening to this will not be aware of is that in Brazil, and in fact, in every Amazon country, uh, we have now gotten to a point where half of that territory, which is as big as the 48 states, between conservation areas and demarcated indigenous reserves is 50% formally protected. Excellent, thank you.